Hello and welcome to the first ever video podcast for BS1547, Introduction to Economics. This one dealing with the first cycle of tutorial material, weeks four and five, looking at demand and supply. Now, a couple of apologies before we start. This is my first ever video podcast. I'm currently dangling my camera phone from a lamp in my room, so there may be some movement on the screen. But nevertheless, I hope that what we do here will be some use to you to think about and cogitate but the material at your own length, really, no leisure. Okay, can you make sure that you have the um, material, tutorial material in front of you that we're going through? If not, press pause and come back, and then we start. Okay, question one is telling us about a student residence called Damprot House in Cardiff. Now, Damprot House has a downward sloping demand schedule, which would be the same as virtually any other good we care to think about, with the exception of Giffin and bedroom goods. So we have our demand schedule, as usual, with price and quantity on each axis, and a downward sloping schedule from left to right, which is our initial demand. Now, we are asked about equilibrium demand and supply for this good. So the first thing we'll do is draw a notional supply curve on. As your teacher should have told you, this is effectively made up. It doesn't really matter what that is, and we'll talk about that when, when we come to the latter, latter part of the question. So, what we have here is an initial equilibrium where demand and supply are clearing, the market is clearing at a level of R1, which I'll call the rent level, for the damp house initially, and Q1, which is then the room sold in a given year. R1 would typically be P1 in any other graph. Now, we are told that across the road, down the road, there's another student home open called uh, Chunder Holes, a similar student property. Now, here we have a change to the market. In this case, we have a new product coming online, which will affect the demand for our own good. And in this case, we have a substitute product. Chunder Holes is a substitute for that broad house. And we know that for substitutes, we have a lower quantity sold of our own good at each and every price. And the way that we show this on the graph is to shift the demand curve and to shift it left. And we'll see exactly what happens here. By shifting our demand curve effectively to the left to a level of D dashed. And we're going to see now that if we were to look at how much, how many rooms we would sell at the original price of rent one, R1, instead of selling Q1 here, we would actually end up selling something around Q2 here. Now what happens, of course, is that the response to um, of that broad house to the new competitor is to cut its prices in order to compete and sell the available rooms, but at the same time, it becomes less attractive to sell rooms. So, that broad house owners may take one or two rooms off the market and use them for other purposes, maybe to refit them in anticipation of higher demand, uh, to rent out to non-students, or in, indeed to live in themselves. What that means is that the price will fall, supply will fall, and we will move effectively along the supply curve to our new level of demand here, And we have a new market equilibrium at Q2, where the rent, the damp rod house, charges moves to R2. <clears throat> so effectively now we have a lower level of price, a lower level of quantity demanded in the market for our own good, following a competitor good moving um, into the market. If we move on then to question B, we can talk about an increase in tuition fees across all courses of Cardiff University. Now, tuition fees are a complementary good instead of a substitute good. So we have a good effectively uh, that is sold in conjunction with our rooms at Dambrot House in order to make a final product, that final product being something you might call university education. So here we have uh, an increase in tuition fees which effectively makes that combined good, university education, more expensive. So without the price changing of our own good, we have 
a situation where there will be less people buying that good at each rent level because the value of the sorry the cost of the combined good is higher overall. And effectively what this means is that we would see exactly the same movement in the demand curve as we saw for the increase uh, sorry as we saw for the entry to the market of the new substitute good. So the increasing price of complement or the increasing availability or decreasing price of a substitute will have exactly the same effect and here would have moved the equilibrium for the market from point A to point B, this being point A and this being point B, exactly the same uh, result and similarly if we look at part C of question A, uh, question 1 pardon me, we have a putative shift in consumer tastes the discovery that Dan Brot House was once home to a brutal serial fish strangler, we would expect perhaps that less people would want to live in a house with uh, an unpleasant history, and therefore we would sell, be able to sell less rooms at each and every price, and the, the shift from D to D dashed in the demand curve would be replicated for that example as well. Now if we move on to a different example, which is given in part D of question, one, I'll just draw the demand and supply curves again. Now here we are told that there's the discovery of new building techniques which enable rooms in existing buildings to be cheaply subdivided in two meter by three meter boxes. So effectively what we have is a house which maybe would have had eight student rooms in the past and now being able to hold uh, 16 student rooms, let's example, for an example. Now this is an example of a technical development, a technological development, and we know that these do not change demand. The level of student demand for the rooms in question has not been altered this time. Let's go back to the original supply and demand. In an exam, uh, you'll never be expected to layer different um, changes of the market on top of each other. You know, you can treat one as effectively independent of all the others. Um, and deal with them one by one. Don't don't confuse yourself by changing the market more than one time. You can always go back and show the example of a discrete independent impact on the market rather than trying to overcomplicate your diagrams. So here we have uh, for party the discovery of new building techniques which enable rooms to be cheaply subdivided. Now what we're effectively saying is that at each level of price that the supplier in this case can gain for his good he is able to bring more goods to market and make a profit. In this case, we are talking about renting out more rooms to the student market and making a profit at each and every price. So here what we do is not shift the demand curve, but instead we are going to shift the supply curve. And we will shift the supply curve outward. Now I'm not going to be able to draw a doubling in, in supply because I'm too far away from the edge of the paper. But nevertheless, you can see that a theoretical increase uh, in the availability of rooms driven by technological advance will increase the level of supply. And this of course will have different impacts on the market. Note that as before we will see a lowering in rent. What will happen is that as the rooms flood onto the market, the new subdivided rooms, we will see a move along the demand curve this time towards a new equilibrium. So damp rot house will bring more goods to the market, more rooms to the market, and these rooms will be sold at a lower price of R2. So we have more rooms sold at a lower price. And that's the example of what the change in a supply side factor would give us. And we might see exactly the same thing if we lowered tax on the good, for example, lower the cost of an input, we would see supply curve shift to a new equilibrium. And note now that we have certainly a lower price, but a higher quantity demanded. So these two things are moving in different directions. Okay, let's have a look at question two. Under what circumstances might a government impose maximum price in a market? What does such a law look like on a diagram? Now there are clearly two parts to this question. This might be something similar to an essay question that might come up in the exam. So the first thing you need to realize, of course, you have to write in prose English when you are answering questions in the exam. You have to write essay style. So we've covered this material in um, in lectures, um, and I'll just reiterate that what we have when we have um, 
goods um, that sometimes suffer maximum price regulation is goods which the government think um, are necessities that are otherwise unavailable if the market was allowed to clear at its own price. So we are talking about things such as, we think, um, maybe uh, bread and basic food stuff. Rent, in some cases, where you have very, very high, um, very, very high uh, demand for housing in very constrained areas. Um, and uh, another one might be, for example, gas, electricity, uh, and uh, water, i.e. basic utilities, which clearly uh, may suffer very high levels of demand um, and, as a consequence, very high levels of price in an unregulated market. So we're talking about necessities, really. Um, that the government thinks are required for basic welfare of its citizens. And the government might think we're imposing a maximum price on these typically very inelastic goods in order to um, uh, to respond to that and make sure they're available for the maximum number of people. Now, of course, this isn't necessarily what you'd have to write for, um, for a question on supply and demand, but don't forget that you know, we're talking about um, inelastic goods typically for these sorts of products. and. In that case, there's an incentive for companies to restrict uh, supply, to cut supply, to move upwards on this um, demand curve and charge a high price uh, and then increase their revenue. So we've got a situation where we're intervening in markets as a government because we think um, that um, you know there's, there's, a, there's a basic welfare issue. So let's look at the supply curve for this. As I said before, it doesn't really matter about the slope of the supply curve. And we have a situation where the market would normally um, balance, would normally clear at a level of P1 and Q1. And what we're saying now is the government imposes a maximum price. Now the first thing to realise is there is little point in the government imposing a maximum price at this level here, call this PH, high price, because this is above the market equilibrium. This would have no impact on the market. In a higher price uh, would simply leave the market price unchanged because nobody wants to buy or sell at that high price anyway. So what we would typically find is that the government will impose a maximum market price somewhere below market equilibrium. Let's call it PM for P max. Now this is the price at above which companies are not allowed to sell. There's no, no ability for companies to sell at any price level higher than PM. And this does change the market, it changes significantly. Well, what this does is this minimizes the incentive for companies to supply because they cannot make, uh, make enough of a profit at PM. And it maximizes the incentive for people to buy because, of course, at a lower price, people are more people are able to buy because of their income level, more people are willing to buy because they value that good, the utility of that good, more highly than the low price. So we have a mismatch in supply and demand, and that mismatch is effectively uh, shown by where the price maximum PM crosses the supply side, which tells us how many companies wish to supply that good at the lower price, and the demand curve, the demand schedule, where which tells us how many com how many people want to buy that product at the new price. So we have, for the first time really, two different levels of quantity supplied and quantity demanded. And what we have here is a shortfall. This level, which we call X, is the shortfall between the level of supply and the level of demand. Now what you'd be expected to do in, in the exam question certainly is explain that this means the market is effectively under pressure. There are people looking for goods which are not available to supply because the companies are not able to bring them to market. And people are chasing those goods in what we call secondary markets. I've given you the example of eBay, for example, and black markets, illegal markets. And there's pressure for the price to return towards the original market equilibrium, let's call it A. That's where the price wants to get back to. So the government has to try to beef up its policies try to um, impose legal penalties 
on companies and on people who try to sell at this higher price because that defeats the object of their policy. And that's why we have um, very strong penalties for, for example, reselling um, goods in wartime when we had rationing and, and, and artificially low prices when the supply was very restricted. And um, in other cases. So that's effectively the, the um, diagram you need. You need some examples of what goods we're talking about and you need a little bit of discussion around what the government tries to do to stop the market actually balancing and how successful they might be. And I give you some examples of that in the um, in the lectures. Okay, finally then, sort of question three. Well, we have the information that in 1999, the UK imposed a minimum wage of £3.60 for adults. Again, let's start with our pay. Typical demand down supply curves. Graphs, price and quantity. Now, this time, instead of having price on the upper axis, I'm going to put W for wages, uh, because wages pardon me, um, are, the, are the prices of labour, which in this case is, is what we're looking at. Here, we've got a situation where formerly consumers have now become suppliers because they're supplying their labour to firms who have switched around to become the purchasers of that labour. So the first thing is to show diagrammatically what might happen to supply and demand for labour, assuming the minimum wage was higher than existing wages in low-skill occupations. I mean, the minimum wage only really applied to low-skill occupations. Again, let's start off with a demand supply curve, and I don't really care again what the... Uh, what the slope of those lines are. Now we know the market wants to balance at a wage level of W1 and um, a quantity of, of labor de demanded, this is quantity of labor demanded on the bottom of Q1. And you know, I mean, what we're saying is that the government thinks in a free market, this might be too low. Let's say that's three pounds, for example, it doesn't really matter what the number is, but you can imagine that um, the government thinks this market balancing uh, level of labour is unfair to people who then have to provide labour at very low, uh, very low levels of wages. Hence, with um, with um, welfare implications for them and their families. So we have here now a government which says to companies effectively, you cannot buy labour. You're not allowed to buy labour at anything lower than um, a certain level of price. In this case, the price we are going to um, be allowed to charge effectively is W. Min, we call that the minimum wage, which as we told in the question, three pounds sixty. These numbers are only here for illustration. You don't need to worry about them um, at all in terms of their actual levels. So they're just for illustration. This is then the flip side of our example for um, for minimum. Uh, sorry, for maximum price. Um, here we have a welfare issue, yes, but the welfare issue is on the supplier side. Um, examples of this, apart from the minimum wage, would be where farmers in Europe under the common agricultural policy are given a minimum price for their outputs because otherwise governments think there wouldn't be enough food, uh, particularly for times of emergency, which is the really big problem after the Second World War. In this case, we have a government imposed minimum price. Nothing below this level is allowable in the market effectively. You know, and it is against the law to pay somebody less than three pounds sixty with some caveats for, for 18 to 21 year olds and so on. Um, and of course, that, that three pounds sixty has now increased markedly uh, since 1999. So we have a minimum price in the market. Anything above this level can be charged. But of course, the market wants the balance down here at W1, Q1. Now, what we have here is the reverse of the maximum price situation, we have an excess of supply over demand. We have quantity QS which is supplied and a quantity QD which is again demanded. Remember now we're talking about labour. So this is how many people effectively want to work at the higher wage. This is how many firms want to hire labour. Pardon me, just put those on the screen. This is how many people want to work at the higher wage. This is how many people uh, how many firms want to buy labour at a higher wage. So there's a mismatch. Not enough firms are looking to hire people at a higher level of wage. And we can see, if I just draw this a little bit further up here for clarity, that there's a shortfall. Here we call it again X in the, in the quantity demanded over the quantity supplied. So the reverse image of what we saw before. Now, of course, this is people. So that X there is actually unemployment. That's the excess number of people who want to work at a higher wage, um, but are unable to. Now this graph is half your answer, and you're asked about who might be the main winners and losers from this law. 
this is a little bit more complicated than, than we thought of before because we now have to think about different sorts of consumers, different sorts of suppliers within within a very broad graph. And if you think about it, well, the, clearly the first batch of winners, if you like, are people who are employed at the new higher minimum wage who were employed at the old free level of wage. So people who were formerly in 1998 earning three pounds an hour, moved in 1999 and the government imposed minimum wage, now earn three pounds 60 an hour, Clearly, they're much better off than they were before. 60 pence an hour, better off, in fact. So they, they're certainly the winners. The losers, well, of course, this X level here implies an increased level of unemployment um, compared to the old market clearing supply and demand a day. And these, this X level here, this level of unemployment, are the major losers. These are people who have lost their jobs or cannot now get jobs because of the level of uh, the level of demand from firms for labour is now lower. So there are people who want to work at a higher level of wages, 3.60, who cannot because there are insufficient firms to hire them. You can also argue, of course, that the firms themselves might lose because they have to charge a higher, um, so they have to pay a higher price for inputs for um, for their products. This will clearly knock on into product markets where they'll be able to supply less because their input costs will have gone up. And you can imagine, of course, that, that will upset product markets. Revenue will change, possibly go down. It may impact on profits for the firm. So there are various um, winners and losers uh, from this um, minimum wage um, imposition. And what we've had in the UK since then is, of course, a very large increase in the number of public sector workers. I come back to this a lot um, when we talk about macroeconomics. Large increase in the number of public sector workers. So we haven't, didn't really see this X level develop um, from 1999 through 2006 or seven, because the argument there was that by hiring more and more um, workers itself, the government was mopping up the excess supply. It was effectively um, filling this gap in supply and demand by hiring public sector workers, um, clearly at a higher wage rate, um, and not then showing the direct impacts of its um, policy on, in this case, the labour market. Okay, I think that's about it. Uh, I'll stop there, 22 minutes, which is plenty. Um, I hope this has been of some use and I hope to repeat it um, for your second tutorial on elasticity in a couple of weeks' time.